Okay, so we're live here. We're going to talk about finding some parametrizations of some various lines, curves, etc. Uh, and we're going to look at something that's linear to start, but then move into something that we'll need maybe trig functions to parametrize. So first let's start with the, an example that we're very familiar with from Algebra 1, which is, which is just taking two points and then finding the line that goes between those two points but we want to find a parametric representation of the line. So at first here, I'm just going to forget that I'm in advanced math and I'm going to forget about the parametrization. I'm just going to write an equation of the line that passes through those two points. So I'm going to do this in, uh, I guess I'll use point slope form here. So I guess first I'll compute the slope, which will be the difference in the y values over the difference in the x values. So the slope of the line that passes through these two points is uh, negative 9 over negative 5, so it's 9 fifths. And then to write the equation of the line in point slope form, I need the slope of the line and one point on the line. And I have two points that are on the line. It does not matter which point that I use. I'll use the point 3, 4. So my slope is 9 fifths, my point that I'm going to use is 3, 4, and just a quick refresher, point slope form is y minus the y coordinate equals the slope times the quantity x minus the x coordinate. So the equation of my line would be y minus 4 equals 9 fifths times x minus 3. And if I wanted that for some reason to, to read as, to have the y isolated, I could just add the 4 to the other side. So it's 9 fifths times the quantity x minus 3 plus 4. So there's the equation of that line. Uh, the, the Cartesian version of the, of, of the equation of the line that runs through those two points. There, there's the Cartesian equation. What does Cartesian mean? In terms of x and y. Okay. So there's some people asking questions when they're not supposed to, but Cartesian does mean in terms of x and y, that means we can graph this on the Cartesian plane. So you've always been writing functions, they're, they've always been Cartesian functions, it's just maybe you haven't used the word Cartesian to describe them when that's really what, what they were. Now great, so I could turn this into a parametrization really easily because I could just let x equal t and I could let y equal 9 fifths t minus 3 plus 4. So that's right there, that's kind of the, the trivial parametrization where I'm just letting x equal my, my parameter, aka I'm calling it t in this case, usually because I'm dealing with things in terms of time. And then I just write the what y equals and everywhere I see an x I just substitute in a t. So that's totally legitimate and valid but not very interesting. So another way to do this to come up with a parametrization, not sort of this trivial parametrization, that's actually super easy, is to just make a table with t, x, and y, and then come up with a rule that works for your table for x and t, and then do the same thing for y and t. So I've got my points are negative 2, negative 5, and 3, 4. Now since I'm coming up with the parametrization myself, I can pick sort of the time value that I want to start at. And I can pick the point that I want to start at. So I'm going to say at time equals 0, I'm at the point negative 2, negative 5. So now I'm going to be moving along the line. And at some measurement of time, I'm going to be standing at the point 3, 4. Now since I'm coming up with this parametrization myself, I want to make this easy. So I'm just going to say after one unit of time, I'm standing at the point 3, 4. So I'm starting at the point negative 2, 5, walking along the line, and then after one unit of time, I wind up at the point 3, 4. That's sort of my starting point and my stopping point. So now I just need to come up with an equation for x in terms of t. So when t is 0, x is going to be negative 2. And when t is 1, x is going to be 3. So I think the <coughs> equation that I'm looking for here is x equals 5t minus 2. 
Now let's think about why that works. When I make t zero, five times zero minus two is negative two. And when I make t one, five times one minus two is three. So I'm just writing sort of a linear equation here. I could almost look at this table where t is zero and x is negative two and think of that as like my y intercept, but in terms of x. And then I could think of the slope as being five because as t goes up by 1, x is increasing by 5. So I could think of 5 as my slope between x and t, so to speak. So it just requires a little bit of rearranging of the variables in your head and a little guess and check to get this to pan out. So y is going to be, when t is 0, I need y to be negative 5. And then when t goes up by 1, y goes up by 9. So I'm looking at that as my slope. So there is a parametrization of the line. So notice that looks very different from the first parametrization, but they're both, they both validly characterize this line. And uh, some of the questions in the book talked about, you know, finding a parametrization for a particular segment. And this second method is really nice for that because I've already parametrized the segment and I've found the time interval that parametrizes the segment. So in here, if I specifically made t is an element of the closed interval 0 to 1, then my parametrization would be just the segment having endpoints negative 2, negative 5, and 3, 4. If I made t be an element of negative infinity to infinity, that would parametrize the entire line. So since, since this particular problem says that I'm parametrizing the line, I should probably specify in both of them that t is on the interval of negative infinity to infinity. I'm going to squeeze that in there. So that's, that's going to be for both parametrizations. So now let's, let's look at something that's not linear that's a little bit more complicated where I might need to parametrize and use sort of like a, a, a trig function. Oh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I apparently threw in another question here about eliminating the parameter and throw, threw up a new uh, parametric model. So actually, before I do that question... I'm going to eliminate the parameter with that line that I just found. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two eliminate the parameter questions here. So the line that I just found, I just found that x equaled, so x is 5t minus 2 in that problem I just did, and y is 9t uh, minus 5. So if I wanted to eliminate the parameter here, I would just solve one of these equations for t. I get to choose which one and then do some substitution. So I'm going to solve this first equation for t. So if I added 2 to both sides and divided by 5, I would get x plus 2 over 5 is t. And then everywhere I see a t in the second equation, I'm going to substitute in an x plus 2 over 5. So y equals 9 times the quantity x plus 2 over 5 minus 5. So that is, I have eliminated the parameter, and I've written a Cartesian version of that line. Now that looks a little bit differently than the equation that I wrote on the first slide in terms of the equation of the line in point-slope form, but they are equivalent if you distribute and collect like terms and whatnot. Now, contrast that, though, with this question at hand, eliminating the parameter of this, of these two parametric equations, is that I'm not... I'm not going to solve one of these equations for t and then substitute. I'm going to be a little bit more clever and use a trig identity that I know. So I'm actually going to isolate the cosine t and the sine t. So if I divide both sides by 3 here and divide both sides of the second equation by 2, I get x over 3 is cosine t and y over 2 is sine t. So I'm going to take both those equations. I'm going to square both sides. I get x squared over 9 is cosine squared t, and y squared over 4 is sine squared t. And now I'm going to use what I know about 
uh, trig functions, I'm going to use that I know the Pythagorean theorem in terms of trig functions, which is cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. That's a statement that I know is true for all real t. And now I'm going to substitute x squared over 9 in for the cosine squared t and y squared over 4 in for the sine squared t. So I guess I'm still using substitution, but I'm just being a little bit more clever about what I'm substituting in order to have a Cartesian equation in terms of x and y and have t be no longer part of my model. So it looks like I've wound up with something that's an ellipse uh, centered at the origin with a major axis of length 6 and a minor axis of length of length 4 with vertices at 3, 0, negative 3, 0, 0, 2, and 0, 0, negative 2. So these problems are kind of just about having experience and knowing when you can just do some brute force substitution like this first method versus something a little bit more clever like I did over here in the second method. So now we've got to finish. We haven't uh, actually finished doing one of these problems involving parametrizing something more complicated where we need some trig functions um, that's not, that doesn't just work out to be like a, a nice ellipse or a circle. So, I mean, th this, is, this is a circle. It's a Ferris wheel, but it has a, I've shifted it up and, you know, the period's not going to be too pi here. So there's, there's some things to take into account. So the first thing is I need to have my drawing and I need to specifically reference where the origin is. So here's the coordinate plane and here's the origin. Now the Ferris wheel is 8 feet, the lowest point of the Ferris wheel is 8 feet off the ground. So I'm having the x-axis be the ground, that's usually how I do the problems, with the lowest point on the Ferris wheel being 0, 8. And now I'm going to draw a picture of the Ferris wheel. There's the Ferris wheel. And the radius of the Ferris wheel is 50 feet. So the highest point on the Ferris wheel would be 0, 58. Uh, 0, 108. Thank you, thank you. 0, 108. So now I need to figure out the, the points that I'm probably most interested in are these other two points. So I need to think... From the center of the circle, that's a, the horizontal distance of 50 feet because the radius of the Ferris wheel is 50 feet. But then I need to be thinking it's a vertical distance of 58 feet because, again, the radius is 50, but then the wheel is 8 feet off the ground. So that point's going to be 50, 58. And then the point on the left is going to be negative 50, 58. So now what I want to do here is I want to make a table with t, x, and y. And I want to see kind of if I can write some functions uh, to fit t and x and then t and y. So I'm starting at t equals 0 at the point 0, 8. So it's like I get on at like the lowest point, and then the ride's going to start. So at t equals 0, I'm at the point 0, 8. And the Ferris wheel revolves once every 70 seconds. So now I need the time values for every quarter of a revolution. So I'm thinking 70 divided by 4 is 7. So every 17.5 seconds, it's going to be a quarter of, you're going to move a quarter of the revolution around. So at 17.5 seconds, you'll be at the point 50.58. At 35 seconds, you'll be at 0, 108. At 52.5 seconds, we'll be at negative 50, 58. And then at 70 seconds, we'll be back to where we started, which is 0, 8. So just thinking about this, if my horizontal positions are going to start fully repeating every 70 seconds, and my vertical positions are doing the same, so I'm going to need periodic functions in t and x and y and x. And I think I can do this with just basic trig functions. So if I'm looking at x, so again, I'm just looking at x and t. 
So the period is 70 seconds. So let's, let's start with that. So if my period is 70 seconds, and I'm going to model this with a sinusoidal function, either a sine function or a cosine function, so I know that the period is going to be equal to 2 pi over b, where b is the coefficient on t in the sine, in the sine of the cosine function. So b in this case is going to be uh, 2 pi over 70. And that'll be the coefficient for, for both for both the for both the x of t and y of t functions. And I can use either sine or cosine functions here in my choice. So looking at these x values, they're going 0, 50, 0, negative 50, 0. That's kind of reminding me of the sine values as I go in multiples of pi over 2 around the unit circle. So the sine values, if I started at 0 and then went in increments of pi over 2, would go 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. So I'm thinking this is going to be a sine function, but stretched by a factor of 50, because, it's, because the amplitude here is 50. So this will be 50 sine of 2 pi over 70 t. And there's no uh, horizontal or vertical shift here. So, so there's my function. There's x as a function of time here. There's the horizontal distance as a function of time. So now I can do the same thing for y. But again, now I'm looking only at the time values and the y values. So the y values are going from 8 to 58 to 108 to 58 to 8. So it looks like the, the height value of 8 is a minimum, and I'm starting with a minimum right on the t-axis, so that'll be a cosine function, but a negative cosine function. Uh, I, need, I need that lead coefficient to be negative. So that'll be negative 50 cosine of 2 pi over 70 t. And now, I think I'm going to need a vertical shift here, because if the amplitude here is 50, and there was no vertical shift, I just had the function negative 50 cosine of t, then that first point would be 0 comma negative 50. But it's not 0 negative 50, it's 0 8. So I need to induce a vertical shift of 58, of up 58 units. So right there is my parametrization describing the horizontal position in terms of time and the vertical position in terms of time around the Ferris wheel.